Not inactivity, not a lot of contemplation in Mark. It's move, 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 move toward the cross, move toward the purpose. Then, next, immediately, all those terms used to give the indication that when Peter was telling Mark his memoirs and Mark was recording them, that there was this drivenness to the cross. And we come today to Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 21. I want to read this to you, and I'm reading from the ESV, and I hope you have your own Bible. If you don't have a Bible for some reason, let us know. We, we want to get you one. But it's on the, the text is on the screen so all can see this wonderful word of the Lord. Stand with me, if you would, as I read God's word. Jesus, remember, has just said something to him about the Pharisees. The Pharisees had come to trap him. He exposes them again. They get in the boat, and this is very much still on his mind. Listen to him. Now when they'd forgotten to bring bread, they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And, and he cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Be a, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the 4,000. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? What a question. Do you not understand? We've got to wrestle with this because we've just read together what? The inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And we need to be reminded, warned again, don't be a Pharisee. Thank you. Be seated. Jesus gives a warning as I think he reads their mind. They were sitting in the boat. They only had one loaf of bread. Things are going through their mind and, and it's going to come out. But he gives a warning about this leaven. Leaven is used to make bread rise. And it, it conveyed in Jesus' time a strong religious message for the Jews who lived in the first century. Uh, during the Passover celebration, all Israel would eat unleavened bread to remind them of their quick flight from Egypt. You see, leavened bread takes a while. Unleavened bread is, is bread cooked in a hurry, is what they learned to think of it as. When the bread would not have time to rise, and they wouldn't have to take time to let it rise, they would cook the bread and be ready in a moment's notice. Now, by Jesus' day, leaven had become a powerful symbol that indicated impurity. It represented an ingredient that watered down something that had originally been pure, that you would take something pure and insert leaven. We, we read to you when we looked a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago at this previous passage of the leavening effect. And the Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5, that don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the whole loaf? It only takes a little bit. That's why it's critical that we're going through this study in, uh, together as life group on Sunday evening. Of, I am a church member. I will, I will be a unifying church member. That's what we looked at a, a couple of Sundays ago. I will be a unifying church. Because see, churches have peace makers and peace breakers. And peace breakers are, are 11 that has a corrupting influence in the life of a church. I want us to see for just a few minutes this morning, uh, look, look at five different angles, if you please, at this passage where, first of all, Jesus warns the disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. We're going to 
delve a little more into what that meant. Secondly, the, you find them fussing over bread. This is ironic to me. Fussing over bread in the presence of the bread of life. And then third, Jesus challenges their understanding. And fourth, Jesus reminds them of his ability to provide. And found, finally, all of this because he asked this question that separates a Pharisee from a disciple. The answer to that question separates a Pharisee from a disciple. First of all, let's look at this, this first couple of verses. Jesus warns the disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Verses 14 and 15. Now they, they'd forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them. So that something's going on. Either they're saying something or they're thinking something. He cautions them. Watch out. Be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The Pharisees had come to Jesus previous in the chapter, passage previous to this wanting a sign and their motive was to trick him, trap him. Wanting a sign. You may recall that toward the end of Luke's gospel when, when Jesus goes through the mock trial and is dragged to Herod's palace that Herod then says, well, I've heard about, heard about you. I heard you do, do a miracle for me. It's interesting because you see the Pharisees and Herod represent two different sides of a spectrum. The Pharisees are all about, all about keeping the law, all about putting on the appearance of being righteous. Herod mocks it. Herod is a Jew, but he's a puppet to Rome. Herod was an immoral man. You'll remember that, that, that he had a, a party where where the young woman danced a provocative dance. So provocative that he promised her a great reward if she would dance that for him. And that's how John the Baptist's head ended up on a platter. Herod is a wicked man, openly wicked. John the Baptist ends up in prison because he has, he has challenged Herod because he's in an immoral relationship. The Pharisees represent all that is right about Judaism externally. Their problem is they think their right deeds, they think what they do and they think what they avoid earns them some sort of arrangement with the Lord, with God, so that they will be saved. They will spend eternity in heaven with Jehovah. Herod doesn't make any kind of religious pretense like that. He's a Jew who sold his soul to Rome. So you have here this contrast of legalism on the part of the Pharisees, law keeping, do this and live, that was their, their mantra. This, this contrast between Legalism and licentiousness, just living any way you want. But they have this much in common. They, I think, pretended, I think, to want a sign from Jesus to, to believe that he is who he says he is. The Pharisees did it to trick him. Herod did it to mock him. Because had he granted their request, they still would not have believed. And he knew that. And he didn't come to be the entertainment for the religious culture or for the pagan culture. He came to save sinners from their sin. And Herod and the Pharisees had this much in common as well. They, they did not see themselves as sinners. Pharisees were offended when Jesus would suggest that. When he would say things like, you err. You err not knowing the scripture. You want to offend a Pharisee? He had to memorize their Old Testament. as one of the qualifications for becoming a Pharisee. You say, well, that's kind of bizarre that they would do that. Folks, just, just last week an article came out about ISIS that they're giving 
They're having a contest among their fighters to see who can memorize the Quran. And whoever does gets his own sex slave. Jesus offended them when he would say, you, your error is you don't know the scriptures. Another place he says, have you not read in the scripture? <laughs> read it, they memorized it. He didn't come. Toss up a bunch of signs. We've already studied earlier in Mark that Jesus' miracle ministry, he tells us why he does miracles. There's a window he lets us look through. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. I do this. I command this man to take up his bed and walk away. This crippled man to do this. His miracle ministry was always tied to his power to forgive sins. So when the Pharisees ask him for a sign, they're not interested in that so that they might have their sins forgiven. They're, when Herod asks him for a sign, he's not interested in that either. Watch out, he says. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Neither legalism nor licentiousness has any redemptive role to play in the kingdom of God. But rather, righteousness imputed by the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Secondly, I want you to see that this, this fussing over bread in the presence of the bread of life. It says they, be, they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Now you, you know what was going on there. Why didn't you bring bread? I brought my bread. I don't know what you were thinking. There's irony here. This is going on in the presence of the one who had miraculously fed them. Why in the world? In fact, another one of the gospel says he's, he said that because he's mad that we didn't bring bread. <laughs> Why in the, it's amazing how we can get bogged down in minutia and bogged down in things and, and worries and concerns in the very presence of the Savior whose Father is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. We come through a time where, where we didn't know how we were going to make it through and God in His grace and mercy brings us through and then we face another time we go, oh my goodness, how am I going to face that? What's, what's going to happen? How's and this is what He goes after them for. The futility of being concerned about bread when the bread of life is sitting in the boat with you. That's why Jesus would teach, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Your father has dressed them. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. The birds. Now, folks, I don't know if you're not a bird watcher, this, but you, I promise you, you've never been watching birds. Whether they look in your backyard and they're up on the pole, utility line, and one of them just starts to. He just falls to the ground of starvation. The Father feeds them. So they're fussing with one another over bread. And they're doing it in the presence of the bread of life. We need to check our hearts. That we don't look like that. Fussing and fuming, fighting over this, that, and the other in the presence of the one who has met all our needs and will meet all our needs, who has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Look at the third angle on this. Jesus challenges their understanding. This, is, this is, becomes painful. I, I want you to imagine that you're in the boat or you're in a room with Jesus 
And here's the conversation that he begins to have with you. Jesus, aware of this, of this discussion over bread, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Now, if there's a pause there and they're supposed to answer that, it begins to get really uncomfortable. Then one of them might impetuously say, and we, you know, Peter was kind of prone to this, one of them might say, well, because we were all responsible to bring our own bread, and not everybody did. We're traveling with irresponsible people. Can't depend on them. Maybe somebody would have answered something like that, but, but probably it got really quiet. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Because you see, if they give an honest answer about their need, because look, we've we got to eat. We don't know how long we're going to be on this boat. We don't know where, you, where you're going. I mean, we get on the boat and we go over on this side, and we're there a little while, we get on the boat and come back to this side. We don't know where you're going, where you're taking us. We just need to be better prepared than this. And that sounds noble until you realize you're sitting in the boat with the one who miraculously fed thousands. And he's going to get there about that in just a minute. Do you not yet perceive or understand? That's, that's the painful one. He will ask but in another place, have I been so long with you? And still, you don't understand. You see, Isaiah, when Isaiah was commissioned in Isaiah chapter 6, here am I, send me. Go. Go to this people and tell them that what you're going to say, they won't hear. Go and tell them that what you're going to, the word you're going to bring from the Lord is only going to make them harder, not softer. And they're acting like those people. They're acting like the Pharisees. Because every time Jesus would teach in their presence, they would only get harder. They refused to believe. They discounted. When they were told about his miracles, they said, well, it's, it's, it's by Satan that he cast out demons. And Jesus hears that and says, if the chief demon casts out demons, then he's bringing his own house down on his head. They would rather believe the insane than to believe the obvious. And brothers and sisters, I submit to you, that's where we live today. The disciples in their conduct are acting like Pharisees because they don't yet perceive, they don't yet understand. Are your hearts hardened? He said. In other words, have you been with me? And what a warning this is what, to all of us about the danger of of a familiarization. You know, familiarity does breed contempt. Gathering for worship on a regular basis as a habit will, if you're not careful, just build you into a groove where you don't prepare for worship. Where you don't make heart preparation for it. Where when, when the Lord's Day morning comes around, it's almost like it slipped up on us. Oh my goodness, we've got to get some... A hardened, a heart hardened, a calloused heart. That's what he's warning against here. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Now when Luke, when, when Luke records the story of the rich man and the beggar, Lazarus. The rich man dies and goes to Hades and he lifts up and appeals to Father Abraham, this, this, uh, this paradise heaven setting where the beggar man's died and gone into the bosom of Abraham. He looks up and he says, Father Abraham, help, help me. The answer basically is there's no help. Father Abraham, help my, help my brothers go back. And... He says, you want, you want to go back and you want a sign, don't you? And then he says this, Son, remember. You see, eternity will give us quickened, absolute memories. Eternity in heaven will fill us with the memories of those 
who were merciful to us and shared the gospel with us and nurtured us and sang to us and pointed us to Jesus. Hell's quickened memory will bring the memory of every, every gospel approach. My son, remember, in hell, part of the hellishness of hell will be remembering for all of eternity the refusals, the rejection of gospel overtures. Jesus uses the word here, and do, do you not remember? Oh, brothers and sisters, we, we're, in, we're in danger of forgetting. We're in danger of forgetting. Our God has been our God who has helped us in ages past, and He is today our hope for years to come. We must not forget. And Jesus is going to show them that they've easily forgotten. Do you not remember? He reminds them, fourthly, of his ability to provide. Verses 19 and 20. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, 5,000 men, remember, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? It's interesting. They remembered that. Twelve. So you remember the fact, and you remember the act, but somehow you've forgotten the implications. When I fed, fed, fed 4,000 with seven loaves, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. They remembered the instance. Oh yeah, that was great. That was powerful. But they'd forgotten. If they even had ever understood. Because the fifth thing I want us to think about is this question that separates a Pharisee from a disciple. Do you not yet understand? Do you not yet? All that you've seen me do, all that you've heard me say, do you not yet understand? I've taught you, I told you when I was doing, teaching in parables and you asked me privately, why do you teach in parables to the crowd? And I said, because you see, for them the secret of the kingdom has not been given, but to you it has been given. And they will go on seeing but not perceiving. They will go on hearing but not understanding. He had taught them this privately earlier in Mark. And, and now they're acting like the crowd. They're, they're acting like the Pharisees. Do you not yet understand? Oh, brothers and sisters, it's so critical that we perceive God, that we perceive the work of God and we perceive the will of God and we, we perceive the way of God and we perceive the gospel of Jesus Christ in the midst of this. Let me say something to you. I'm as grieved as anyone that we've lived to see a day that my children and grandchildren will have to grow up in a world where the, where the Supreme Court is institutionalized. Same-sex unions. But when the church doesn't seem to understand, when the church doesn't see gospel opportunities, when the church has depended on politicians, and courts, how many, go back a few years, go back. Oh, if we can just get so-and-so elected to office, then he can appoint Supreme Court justices and we can turn this thing around. Bush number one appointed Justice Anthony Kennedy, who is regarded as the swing vote 
on all things moral or immoral in this case. If we can just get so and so elected and he can appoint those Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, who came down on the right side of the same sex union, came down on the totally wrong side of subsidies. He was appointed by Bush number two. You see, the church, and I, th I think if we can step back a few steps, and, and we need to be engaged in the process, we need to be voting uh, faithfully, contacting our politicians. But we let ourselves, and I'm, I'm talking about we collectively, not you individually, we let ourselves as a church in the West, the church in this country, act like Americans who happen to be Christians thinking that somewhere in the process of America we would be saved, we would be rescued. And, and when you think that way, that's, that's an attitude that says we can save ourselves. If we can get the right people in office to make the right decisions, we can, be, we can save ourselves. And the Lord has called us all along to be Christians who happen to be Americans, to thank God for the country we live in. It has been the greatest country in the world. And recognize that we have more in common with our brothers and sisters in Dejun, Haiti, and in Lusaka, Zambia, and in Bulgaria, and Indonesia, and on and on and on we could go. We have more in common with them because we have the common experience of grace in Jesus Christ. That America is not our final resting place. And I believe what God is doing is He is shaking us loose of that. So that we stop, or if we, if we never have, that we never trust in the idea that our political leaders will save us. They were never intended to save us. They're just supposed to act responsibly. responsibly. And we're to look for our hope in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and though these fellows had not yet seen the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, they were supposed to have their hope in, in Jesus, the Messiah. In fact, we're going to get a little farther in Mark, and we're going to see the experience that in Matthew we call the, the confession at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked them finally, who do, you, who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Am I going to keep feeding you with miracles in order for you to believe that I am who I said I am? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? That's where he's headed with this. Do you not yet understand? I submitted to you a few weeks ago that we want to avoid being a Pharisee because it's the default mode in all of us. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned, they began to give birth to little Pharisees. And there's a Pharisee in my heart right now and there's a Pharisee in your heart right now. We've got to make a decision daily if we're going to feed him or if we're going to starve him. How not to be a Pharisee. Consume healthy doses of the gospel on a daily basis. Read the gospel every day. Listen to the gospel every day. Sing the gospel every day. Pray thanking God for the gospel every day. Remember what God did to save you. He sent His only Son. He sent the darling of heaven. Remember what you were before God saved you. Oh, I repent when I find myself worrying, fretting, like I, like I used to do before I became a child of God. Remember what you were before God saved you. And then don't look down on someone as if they do not deserve the grace and mercy of God. 
because you and I do not deserve the grace and mercy of God. It's called grace because it's not deserved. And brothers and sisters, if we're not careful, the times in which we live, the winds that are blowing adversely will, will, will cause us to look away, will distract us, and we will turn our eyes not upon Jesus, we will turn our eyes away from Jesus, and yet more than ever in our lives we must look full into his wonderful face and, so that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. We must remember. We must pray for understanding. The natural mind does not discern the things of the Spirit, for they are spiritually discerned. But the mind can get clouded if we fill it with things that are not noble, that are not lovely, that are not praiseworthy, that are not of good report. You know, what, what things are we thinking on? What things are we thinking on? Oh. Trevor Wax said this. I'm going to close with this. Even today, Christians must watch out for potential leaven in our gospel proclamation. A preoccupation with minor doctrinal details or biblical intricacies can trap us in a legalistic mindset that leads away from the message of love that stands at the heart of the Bible. Turn the gospel message in on ourselves conceals God's light under a bowl instead of allowing it to shine from a lampstand. Others try to make the gospel more palatable for a modern day audience by diluting Jesus' message of repentance and faith. In these cases, listeners often become enamored with the messenger instead of the message. The end result is a corrupt church system that parodies what a true community of believers should be. Jesus warns against joining either camp. The more we add to Jesus' gospel message, the more we subtract from its original purpose. That's what legalism does. It adds to the gospel. The more we dumb down the message to tickle listeners' ears, the greater the impurity grows. Jesus' warning is clear. Watch out for those who are altering God's message and leading others astray. We must not be those people. We must be clear as a bell on the gospel. And be committed to that, and that only. Don't be a Pharisee. If you coast, I promise you, you're going to be a Pharisee. <laughs> you shift into neutral, he'll take the wheels. You fight the fight of faith, put to death remaining sin, slay any in inclination toward legalism, slay any inclination toward licentiousness, and the Pharisee, and you will die a slow, agonizing, death. Let's pray.